So let's now discuss side effects of omeprazole. So I've written down here the major side effects of omeprazole that would lead to me having to stop someone's omeprazole, either temporarily or potentially permanently. So let's go through these one by one. So let's start with the first two up here. So electrolyte disturbances. So in your blood and in the extracellular fluid that bathes all of the cells of your body, there are electrolytes dissolved in that fluid. And one of the most important ones is sodium, uh, salt. Uh, sodium chloride is salt, uh, but you have both sodium and chloride dissolved in your blood and your extracellular fluid. It is very important for the function of all of the cells of your body that the sodium concentration is kept at a normal level. And I'm just going to write down what that normal level is. So I've written down that level here. So it's 135 to 145 millimolar is the normal concentration for sodium. It should be somewhere within that range. And I apologize for people who use potentially different units. I am aware some in some countries around the world, I think potentially America even, which is one of my main viewership uh, bases, uh, they use different units for these sort of things. So potentially Americans, you might be very sad to see these units and you might have to convert that into your own units. Uh, I'm also obviously using the British spelling of hyponatremia and hypomagnesemia and hypokalemia here. So, of course, if you're in other countries, you can just abolish the A. So, anyway, back to the main point. So, sodium is dissolved in all of the fluid of our body, and it should be between these levels. So, 140 would be a brilliant value for sodium to be. Now, derangements in this sodium concentration cause problems. Sodium can go too high, that's quite rare, and sodium can go low, too low, that's much more common. And when sodium becomes too low within the blood and within the extracellular fluid, because the concentration within the blood and the extracellular fluid is the same, so that's how we can measure sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid. We can take a blood sample, and then the sodium concentration in that blood sample is the same as in extracellular fluid. So when the sodium in the blood and the extracellular fluid becomes too low, we call that hypo, meaning low, natri, meaning sodium, and emia, meaning in the blood. So this is too low sodium level within the blood, hyponatremia. So a meprazole, unfortunately, and indeed all the other PPIs, they can cause this as a side effect. They can lower sodium level. They can cause hyponatremia. The reason they do this is because they affect the kidneys. So it's the kidney's job to make sure that all the electrolytes within the body are kept in the right ranges. So, of course, we eat food. The food contains electrolytes. You know, when you eat a salty meal, there's loads of sodium in that. Uh, that is going to be absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract, and then the kidneys are in charge of getting rid of enough of that salt so that you're kept in balance. And, of course, you're getting rid of salt in other ways. So when you sweat, you lose salt. Um, you lose... Uh, so... Uh, some salt is going to have to be kept to make up for the salt that you've lost in the sweat, but then the excess salt is then got rid of by the kidneys. Now, unfortunately, omeprazole disturbs, and all other PPIs disturb the function of the kidneys, and they lead to the kidneys excreting too much salt, and therefore you end up with too little salt in your blood. So they disturb the electrolyte balancing effects of the kidneys. So hyponatremia is a side effect of omeprazole, and it's one that might warrant you stopping the omeprazole if it is bad enough. So you might ask, what happens if you become hyponatremic? Well, the main effect that people get is it affects the brain. Uh, so it can lead to people becoming confused if it's bad enough. And even if it gets really, really horrific, it can lead to people seizing. Um, so just to give you the sort of ranges that you would get concerned at. So 130 to 135 is not that bad. If someone's sodium was 131, I would not be particularly worried. Even 125 to 130, that's still not that bad. So 127 isn't too bad, but I'd probably start to be a little bit concerned at that range. So 125 to 130 is where you start worrying. 
below 125 is bad. 120 to 125, not good. You need to do something about that. And then below 120 is really bad. It's quite rare that you see someone's sodium below 120. That's where it really is going to start causing problems. That person is probably going to become confused, delirious from the low sodium. And if it goes below 115, you're looking at potentially they're going to seize from it. So it's really, really dangerous. Um, so if someone's sodium was lower than 130 and they were on a proton pump inhibitor such as omeprazole, I would probably stop the omeprazole to try and see if it's that that's causing it. Because there are loads of other causes of hyponatremia. It might not be the PPI that's to blame. Uh, but if they are on a PPI and the sodium is below 130, I would probably stop it and see if the sodium comes back up once I've stopped it. And if it does, then I might say to this person, look, we're going to have to stop this medicine permanently and change you to another medicine that can reduce stomach acidity. Because there are other medicines, in particular the H2 antagonists, such as ranitidine or simetidine, uh, and there are others as well, the names of which I, I, I don't know. Uh, but ranitidine was at least the main one until there was this worldwide withdrawal of it that happened earlier this year. You know, they're, they're the two major things that have happened in medicine this year, coronavirus and the worldwide withdrawal of ranitidine because it was contaminated with some carcinogen. But it used to be readily available, easily available in shops, and it was an alternative to PPIs. And hopefully it will come back as an alternative to PPIs once they've sorted this contamination issue out. So let's move on to our next electrolyte derangement that omeprazole can cause. So not only can it disturb the kidney's handling of sodium, it can also disturb the kidney's handling of magnesium, make the kidneys lose too much magnesium, and you can become uh, hypomagnesemic, too low magnesium levels. So the normal level of magnesium within the blood and the extracellular fluid is 0.75 to 1 millimolar. Below 0.75 is when we call it hypomagnesemia. And... Um, Thresholds for concern, between 0.6 and 0.75 is not too bad. Below 0.6 is when you start to get concerned. Below 0.5, very concerned. Below 0.3, extremely concerned. Um, and again, if someone's magnesium was below 0.6 and they were on a PPI, again, I would stop it and... Um, and see if the magnesium comes back up. And if it comes back up, then you can say it was the PPI doing this. Uh, and therefore, you'd probably advise them to stop it permanently and look at going on to an alternative uh, stomach acid reducing drug, such as, as we've mentioned previously, ranitidine. Now, what's the problem with hypermagnesemia? So there are two major electrical organs in the body that can be disturbed by electrolyte derangements because they're really important for the functioning of electrical activities of cells. So the one is the brain and the other is the heart. Sodium mainly hits the brain rather than the heart and causes confusions and potentially seizures. Hypomagnesemia and indeed this other one that we've got down here, hypokalemia, they mainly affect the heart and cause arrhythmias. So the side effect of hypermagnesemia is potentially it can cause arrhythmias. And I'm saying this in general. It can cause problems with the conduction of electrical activity through the heart, potentially leading to abnormal contraction of the heart. And there are loads of different types of electrical arrhythmias of the heart. Mag hypermagnesemia and hypokalemia can cause multiple different types of arrhythmias. And we're not going to go into the different types here. It's a very long and fascinating topic, but we won't uh, touch that here. We'll just say it's dangerous because it can lead to problems with the electrical activity of your heart, which potentially, you know, if it was a horrific arrhythmia, it could lead to death. If it's ventricular fibrillation, then it completely stops the heart beating. Um, and if that, if the heart doesn't go back into a normal rhythm that's going to result in the heart beating soon, uh, you will die from that. So potentially very, very dangerous hypermagnesemia. The other thing that hypermagnesemia can cause is hypokalemia. And this is actually why hypokalemia is on this list. So PPIs do not cause hypokalemia generally. They cause hyponatremia and hypomagnesemia. However, I've put hypokalemia here because hypomagnesemia can actually lead to hypokalemia. So when your magnesium level is low within your blood, this can lead to problems with the kidneys handling of potassium in turn and lead to the kidneys losing too much potassium and therefore result in too low potassium level called hypokalemia within the blood. Again, the major consequence of hypokalemia, like hypomagnesemia, is cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, and I'll just write the normal range for potassium here. 
So the normal range for potassium is 3.5 to 5 millimolar. And again, threshold for concern, 3 to 3.5 is not that bad. Um, below 3 is when you start becoming concerned. 2.5 to 3, you're concerned at that level. You need to do something about that if uh, someone's got a potassium, let's say, of 2.7. Below 2.5 is really quite dangerous. You need to do something urgently if it's below 2.5. Below 2 is life-threateningly dangerous. So uh, do something now. Red flag, red, red siren going off. Alarm, alarm. Um, uh, because it's really, really bad for causing cardiac arrhythmias, potentially fatal cardiac arrhythmias, such as ventricular fibrillation. So just to emphasize this point, I have written hypokalemia here, not because it is a side effect of PPIs, but because it is a consequence of hypomagnesemia. So PPIs can cause hyponatremia and hypomagnesemia. Hypomagnesemia can then lead to hypokalemia, but hypokalemia is not a direct consequence of the PPI. It is a potential secondary consequence of hypomagnesemia, which can be caused by PPIs. So hypomagnesemia is dangerous in two ways. One, because it can cause cardiac arrhythmias by itself, and two, because it can lead to hypokalemia, which is really dangerous for causing cardiac arrhythmias. So we'll have a break here, and in the next video, we'll talk the, through these final two side effects. So as I say, um, just to summarize, if you see someone with a, these electrolyte derangements and they are on a PPI, one of the things you should consider is, is it due to the PPI? Is it due to the omeprazole? Should I stop the omeprazole to try and see if it corrects? And if it does, that would be a reason to permanently stop the omeprazole if you've got electrolyte derangements from it. And indeed, this is a reason that I commonly do stop PPIs. Hypomagnesemia less so, but hyponatremia, I have a lot of patients who are hyponatremic and are on PPIs, and I regularly do at the very least suspend PPIs. And in some of them, it has no effect because the PPI I wasn't the cause of the hyponatremia, it was some other cause, such as post-operative hyponatremia, which is a very common thing. But in others, it is the case that you stop the PPI and the sodium resolves, and then really they need to be off it permanently at that point. And it can be really quite drastic. I've seen people with sodiums as low as 119, where the only attributable cause was uh, that they were taking a meprazole. They were taking very few medicines, but one of them was a meprazole. Uh, that case does stand very starkly in my mind. So these really can cause quite profound derangements in sodium.